Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm a liberal arts lawyer. I took some math courses, but it's been a long time ago. So I'm going to ask the panelists, maybe Mr. Litt, Mr. Inglis, or whoever, to help me do some math here. In 2012, there were 300 queries that resulted in a search of records. And we are told that there are three hops. In other words, if I was the subject matter of this search, and I called Senator Feinstein, they would accumulate all of the records of my telephone calls to her and others, and then all of the records of Senator Feinstein telephone calls, which may have included Chairman Leahy, and now you've included all of his records as well. Mr. Jaffer of the ACLU will testify, at least speculate later, that if I had an average of 40 contacts, that would mean that for my name, my query, you would accumulate 2 million phone records, 2 million for that one inquiry. Now multiply that in the year 2012 by 300. So we are talking about 600 million phone records. Now multiply that times seven years. So what has been described as a discrete program to go after people who would cause us harm, when you look at the reach of this program, in, in, it, it envelops a substantial number of Americans. So can somebody help me with the math here if I've missed something along the way or perhaps should minimize that number? Sir, if I could start and uh, apologizing for the format, the unclassified format, I'll be discreet in my remarks, but happy to follow up in any detail that, uh, that you would prefer either here or at NSA. Uh, first and foremost, the analysts are charged to provide information that is truly useful to the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And so in that regard, they try to be judicious about choosing when to do a second hop or under the court's authorization, a third hop. Um, those aren't always exercised. Uh, they don't always exercise a second hop for all numbers that might be pointed to by the first hop. And so while theoretically 40 times 40 times 40 gets you to a large number, that's not typically what takes place. If an analyst were to see, for example, um, at the second hop, that there are very significant numbers associated with one of those numbers, they would have to come to some deduction as to what that means. That could be that what you kind of glommed onto is a pizza delivery man. You don't want to pursue that. That's not useful. If on that second hop you see that that's hopped to a foreign number already known to the intelligence community because it's a known terrorist, you'd want to make the third hop to understand what's beyond that. I understand that part of it, where you're trying not to waste the time or resources of our government in protecting our nation. Yes, sir. But the potential reach of this, when we say 300, goes way beyond 300. So, so I think that's a very important question. We have to compare the theory to the practice. Uh, we try to be very, very judicious in the use of this very narrowly focused authority. And so the reason that we've declassified the numbers is to show that we are, in fact, judicious. So Less than 300 times did we approve a query for selection or a selector for query in 2012 and provided less than 500 numbers and 12 reports to the FBI in all of 2012. If I can just add one thing to that, it's important to remember that all that we're getting out of this is numbers. Nobody's name, nobody's address, the content of no communications. These are all this is nothing but a tool to try to identify telephone numbers that warrant further inquiry. I understand that. And here is the point that I've offered an amendment before this committee, which garnered a grand total of four votes a few years ago on this very subject, because most of the members weren't aware of this program, 215 program, and its detail. Uh, I knew a little bit more than some, but obviously didn't know as much as I'm learning today. Uh, and there was, there was a genuine concern today expressed at that time, because of the limited knowledge of the members, I got four votes. So here's the question I get down to, and it's asked over and over again. If my cell phone is in area code 217, which it is, uh, and I am a suspect, I certainly think it's appropriate, and I encourage our government to find out wh who I'm talking to. That's important. I still can't get to the point of requiring every person with a 217 area code to have their records collected in terms of their telephone conversations. Now multiply that times every area code across America and look at the potential reach. It seems to me that what's being described as a narrow program is really a very broad program in terms of the metadata collection on the front end. What I'd like to ask, people have said, I've heard it from members of this panel, you know, we've saved lives with this. 
The 215 program has saved lives, stop terrorism. Good. That's what we want our government to do. Could you have also saved the same number of lives and had the same impact if knowing my telephone number as a suspect, you could search my records as opposed to collecting everyone's records in my area code? So if I could go back to a case in point, uh, perhaps that, that might be the best way to tease this out. I think that's a great question. Uh, the Bosali Mawalam case. <clears throat> what we knew at the time when we made that query was we knew a number that we had reasonable suspicion was affiliated with a terrorist group plotting against the homeland. That number was in um, Somalia. It was associated with al-Shabaab. Um, we had reasonable suspicion it was associated with something in the United States. We had no idea what it might have been associated with. And so we needed to do a query. Um, we didn't know whether it would be associated with a 217 area code or a 303 area code. What of the grand kind of set of possibilities was it associated with? In order to find the needle that matched up against that number, we needed the haystack. Right? That's what the premise is in this case. And in that point, um, if just before somebody had made that query, you'd said, this is going to connect to a number in San Diego, that would have been as surprising as if you'd said that number is connected but, to some place in Yemen. But Mr. Inglis, I guess what it gets down to is this. Once establishing that number with al-Shabaab, uh, this operative from al-Shabaab, you could certainly go after that person's telephone records and all of the contacts that that person has made. The basic question we're faced with is, do you need to collect five years' worth of data on everyone in America and their telephone records so that the haystack, which is pretty that's, big... That's a fair question. So, so the, the question would be, um, is it enough to look um, prospectively in the future, right, at that particular number? It may well be that the plotting you're looking for occurred in the past. And if you don't have that person's records in the past, then you can't determine. And a point that's been raised repeatedly, if we required the phone companies to retain the records for five years. That's a very fair point, and that is possible. It would not be in the grasp of the government, but accessed by the government. I agree, Which sir. serves the same purpose, does I agree, it but under the current legal framing, the phone companies are not required to retain that for the benefit of the government. How hard would that be? Um, I think it would require a legal change. I don't think that's hard. I, I don't think, think that so you either. can get there from here. You have to then think about the rest of the attributes that are necessary to make this a useful venture. Uh, Senator Feinstein said, ask him about the expense. Um, I would say in a classified session, I could give you chapter and verse on the expense. The expenses are different depending upon whether you choose the current implementation and you choose an implementation where you leave it at the providers. The government, if it requires the providers to retain those records, should bear that expense. Thank, Thank you. you.